Well, we're going to continue with our study of 2 Timothy. We have completed the first two of the four chapters in 2 Timothy. Again, a very personal, a very intimate letter that the Apostle Paul writes from his prison in Rome. He knows he's about to die. And so he's giving his final instructions to his very close friend, Timothy. Some have been very positive, very encouraging. Some have actually been very uh, severe and very strong to say, Timothy, please, you must be careful of these things. Well, when we last left off in chapter 2, he was using the description of vessels in a house or in a kitchen made of a variety of materials. And he used that example to say, you know, you can be used in honorable ways or dishonorable ways. And if you're being used in dishonorable ways, you had better get cleaned up and you need to pursue the things of Jesus Christ. Well, when we come to chapter 3, he begins a discussion of watching out for dangers of the last days. And the last days to them might have meant the days in which they lived, but the things that you're about to see, you're going to say, these are true of our day. And the things that you're about to see, I describe as being like a cancer. Cancer is a very dangerous, deadly disease. But when I did a little bit of research on how cancer works, I became very interested in how cancer spreads in a human body. For one thing, I found a statistic that said 13% of all deaths in the world are because of cancer. Just this week, I got an email from a friend about someone that I know that has been diagnosed with cancer. Now, another. But one out of about every eight deaths in the world is because of cancer. Well, how does it work? I describe it as a cancer cell starts this little rebellion. He, he finds some other partners to go in this rebellion with, and he begins to attack. And as the attack goes against the human body, the cells multiply and they divide and they begin to choke out the healthy cells in the human body. The thing is, God made the human body with a defense mechanism. Inside of our bloodstream, we have white blood cells. These are the ones who fight off infections. These are the ones who fight off so many things. Why don't white blood cells fight off cancer? In the reading that I did, I found something that interested me a great deal. Here's why white blood cells cannot defeat cancer because cancer cells identify themselves with the body and the white blood cells don't understand that they're a problem. That's very interesting to me. That instead of getting out there and saying, we're a big disease, look at us, they just blend in and to the white blood cell they say, oh, we're just like everybody. And the reason I use that example is there is a cancer in the church of Jesus Christ today. It's dangerous, it's deadly, it destroys, it grows, it multiplies in the same way that cancer does, but it's often very hard to detect until it becomes life-threatening. And the things that you're about to see, the problem is, is these are problems inside the church more than they are problems outside the church. Sometimes in the country in which I live, we in the church get very concerned about the ungodly influences outside of the body of Christ. But what you're about to see, you're going to be tempted to think that you say, yes, this is true of our culture. This is true of the world out there. But when you see the list of things that we're about to share with you, I want you to understand that these are problems that Paul is identifying in the church. So when we talk about navigation in this particular lesson, we've navigated towards some things. We've navigated away from some things. Here's one we want to navigate away from. Here's an iceberg that we don't want to get close to. And I would say it in this term, self-centeredness. The root of the problem in this long list that you're about to see here in chapter 3 is self-centeredness. Just because a person begins a relationship with Jesus Christ does not mean that they're no longer going to struggle with self-centeredness. I do, we do, and the church does. So as the false teaching was coming into this church, and this person would believe this false teacher, this person would believe this false teacher, it would isolate and individualize the problem, and all of a sudden the person would begin to have problems with the self-centered nature of what was happening in their life. And he said, Timothy, 
You have to prepare for this. This is a very serious problem. If I could say in one sentence what you're about to see, this is what I would say. A self-centered church or a self-centered individual can never be Christ-centered. A self-centered church or a self-centered individual is not Christ-centered. And that maybe if we understand the nature of the problem and the diagnosis is made, that maybe we'll understand that the problem can be defeated by the power of Jesus Christ in his death and his resurrection. The sin of self-centeredness is really similar to a term called ungodliness. One author described self-centeredness or ungodliness with this description when he said, ungodliness or self-centeredness may be defined as living one's everyday life with little or no thought of God or of God's will or of God's glory or of one's dependence upon God. God is essentially irrelevant in his or her life. God is essentially irrelevant in his or her life. This is a huge problem in America, in our church. That people come to church on a fairly regular basis. They enjoy the music. They enjoy the teaching. But honestly, our lives in America, even in the church, are often so self-centered that God is almost irrelevant. Until there's a crisis, and then we say, where's God in my crisis? I need God now. Well, Timothy, or Paul's advice to Timothy is going to help us with that very problem. So I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Here's what it says. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self. Lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not having good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. That's a long list. And as I looked at that list, I said, yep, that's exactly what's true in our culture. Every one of those things is true in our culture. And I had to remind myself, no, he said, these are things that are true in the church. And I went, really? All of them in the church? This is a problem? He begins by saying, understand this, that in the last days, as we await the return of Jesus Christ, we don't know what that day is going to be. But understand that the closer we get to the return of Jesus Christ, and we're now a couple of thousand years closer to the return of Jesus Christ than when Paul wrote this letter, he said there are going to come times of difficulty. And that word difficulty means this, hard, dangerous. Timothy, in these last days, the times are getting increasingly dangerous, increasingly difficult in a variety of different degrees. As the return of Jesus Christ comes, the enemy is going to increase his attack. He's going to come at the church, and if the church is not ready, the effectiveness of that church is going to be nullified. I think of so many stories that I have heard out of your country here. People that have been persecuted for their faith over the last century have given their lives for the gospel. We're hearing more and more stories these days out of the Middle East in Islamic countries where where people, because they convert to Christianity, are at best dismissed from their families and at worst killed, executed. Pastors, families, children, in so many different ways. As the return of Jesus Christ comes, the attacks on the church are going to increase. But he says, Timothy, what you must be prepared for is the damage that is being done inside the church. And what you saw as I read verses 2 through the beginning of verse 5 is a list of 18 or 20, depending on how you count them, descriptors of what a self-centered life is. Now, I could take the next hour and go through each one of these words and define them independently, and that would be a valuable pursuit, but I'm going to help you with that. When Paul created this list, 
what he said first and what he said last at the end of this list form two bookends. You know what a bookend is? So I have lots and lots of books in my study back in my church. And on some shelves, I have bookends. So a stack of books is here. Book, 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 book. And on one end is maybe a decorated bookend, and on this end is here. It holds the books together. What you're going to see in verses 2 and in verse 5 is a bookend here and a bookend here that end up explaining everything in the middle. If you'd like to see what that is, take a look at that list in verse 2. I'm not going to read the whole list again. I'm going to stop after the first bookend. He says this, For people will be lovers of self. That's bookend number one. I'm in love with myself. I said, yep, that's the world in which we live. People are just all in love with themselves. That's exactly, that's the problem in our country. He says, no, remember something, Bruce. Or remember something, Timothy. This is a problem inside the church. And I want to say, Paul, do you know what you're talking about? Are you saying that we have self-centered people in our church, but they're followers of Jesus Christ? How could they be self-centered? And then I looked at my own life. I'm a very self-centered person. I come home at the end of the day, and I, I want to just relax. I want to sit and read. Or I want to watch television. I want everyone to just be quiet. I'm a very self-centered person, but I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. He says, in these last days, as the return of Jesus Christ gets closer, people are going to be more and more falling all over themselves with being in love with themselves. And you say, well, Bruce, you've said that the word love is agape, right? It's a self-sacrificing kind of love. Is that the word here? The word here is not that kind of word. There are at least three different words for love in the New Testament. The, the one we've talked about is agape love, self-sacrificing self love. The word here is the word phileo, which is the brother, brotherly affection kind of love. It's the kind of love that pleasures in oneself, that delights only in oneself. And he says, that's what's going to happen when this comes. So when you look at the rest of this list, and I'll tell you the second bookend in a minute, look at how each one of the things he names are actually descriptors of self-centeredness. For people will be lovers of self, that's our bookend. Lovers of money, proud, arrogant, that's self-centered. Abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, that's self-centered. Unholy, heartless, unappeasable, that's self-centered. Slanderous, without self-control, brutal, self-centered. Not loving good, treacherous, reckless, self-centered. All the way down the list, every one of these things' names that he names falls under this umbrella of what a self-centered person looks like. And he says, Timothy, these people are in your church. They're having a great affection for themselves and not the things of God. Augustine, centuries ago, in his book, The City of God, wrote it this way. He said, two cities have been founded by two loves. The earthly, by the love of self, even to the contempt of God. The heavenly, by the love of God, even to the contempt of self. The former, in a word, glorifies itself. The latter glorifies the Lord. Two cities. One glorifies itself. One glorifies God. Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, you belong to the family of God. The people in your churches belong to the family of God, but they're acting like they're glorifying themselves. You have to warn them, because this is only going to increase as the return of Jesus Christ draws close. John Calvin, in his Institutes of Christian Religion, wrote it this way. He said, for so blindly do we all rush in the direction of self-love, that everyone thinks he has good reason to exalt himself. There is no other remedy than to pluck up by the roots that most noxious pets, pest, self-love. There is no other remedy than to pluck up by the roots that most noxious pest, self-love. Have you benefited from this teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting TVS with your prayers and financial gifts. 
For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. I told you in a previous lesson that we have a garden and that my passion as I go out to that garden is instead of looking at the wonderful plants is all I can see is the weeds. I want there to be no weeds in our garden. Some weeds are very easy to pull up and they have very shallow roots. There's very little roots to them. There are some that when I pull on them, I pull and I go, oh, uh. oh, that root goes down deep. And so I get a good grip and I bend over and I get my hands around that, and I pull, and I pull, and finally I pull. And sometimes the roots on those weeds are this long. I go, boy, I'm sure glad I pulled that out. can imagine what damage it would have done in our garden. He, that's what Calvin is saying. The roots of self-centeredness are that deep and that penetrating and that pervasive, and they must be pulled out. That's what self-centeredness is like. And I think that one of the problems that living in this 21st century is there are so many expressions of self-centeredness. I don't believe that there's any new sins. I think Solomon was right when he said there's nothing new under the sun. But our technologies and our advances are exploding so fast and so far and so broad. There are opportunities in this era to be self-centered. I think there are more opportunities than there has ever been before. And one of the most significant problems that we see in the West in this area of self-centeredness is a term that has just simply been called self-esteem. Self-esteem. Our psychologists over the last 50, 60, 70 years have really convinced the American population that you need to feel good about yourself. That if you feel good about yourself, then you'll be able to love other people. That it all begins with me. And they wouldn't say it that simplistically. But essentially, the message is, you need to feel good about yourself. Maybe you come from a dysfunctional home, but look at you. you you've done a good job to rise out of that dysfunction. You can do it. Be all that you can be. You, you can be successful. You can do anything that you want to be. Just have a good self-esteem about you. It's not true. That's not what the Bible talks about. That's a very self-centered nature. One writer said it this way. It is widely claimed that a person cannot love God and other people rightly unless and until he loves himself rightly, completely reversing what the Old and New Testaments teach. Our psychology would say you can't really love other people rightly unless you love yourself first. And that's exactly the opposite of what the Bible says. And you say, well, where does it say that in the Bible? I think you probably remember. Remember the day that some religious leaders came to Jesus on the attack? Hey, Jesus, and I'm, this is my paraphrase. Hey, Jesus, we have a question for you. And they knew they were saying to themselves, he'll never be able to answer this question. Hey, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And they were laughing. <laughs> There's 613 Jewish commands, and they added about a thousand more of their own. So there's 1,600 commands. No one knows what the greatest one is. But Jesus is never going to be able to answer that question. Jesus doesn't even hesitate. He said, not only will I give you the greatest commandment, I'll give you the second greatest command. And Jesus says these words. I, I wonder if you remember them. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second one is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't say anything in there about putting yourself first. In fact, what the Bible says, we should love God first, and as we love God first, as we find our identity in who God is, we will find a love for other people. And the love for other people will then be reflected in a healthy self-image of who we are. But we don't start with who we are. We start with God. And our love for God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength is reflected in a love for other people that is appropriate in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an appropriate love that we have for ourselves. So what does a Christ-centered or a selfless life look like? What does a Christ-centered or a selfless life look like? Well, let me show you something else in these verses. I didn't give you the second book in. 
I want you to go to verse 5, where it says this, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Actually, I should go back one more phrase. So check that. The end of verse 4 says this, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. The other end of self-centeredness is a love of pleasure rather than a love of God. They have a form of godliness that looks pretty good on the outside, but when you get underneath the skin of it, when you get underneath it, you find out that you really deny its power. It's weak. It's worthless. That's the second bookend of self-centeredness. Well, how do I escape that? What am I supposed to do? Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.